Hello, everyone. In this session, we're going to talk about question number seven and eight from the practice assessment two from the ATU website for the management accounting decision and control. And uh, we'll talk about uh, task seven for 18 marks. And this question is from limiting factor. Now, uh, personally, I like this topic. It's quite interesting. A limiting factor and the learning curve area. So on the management accounting, this is one of the area that's quite interesting because you'll feel you're going to learn something and that actually you can use it in uh, the workplace or uh, in your future business. Uh, the reason I said it's quite interesting because uh, when you do the calculation, your decision will be something else but when you actually try to look at the limiting factor you will change your decision so let's try to understand what i mean <clears throat> uh, before you start let's talk about a little bit the limiting factor what is limiting factor and how is it work a limiting factor as the word said limiting factor that means uh, either uh, uh, something is not enough uh, to fulfill the demand or there is some shortage of the resources so here, mainly we're going to look at, there will be shortage of the resources. Now, shortage of the resources means could be labor hour, could be machine hour, or it could be the material. Normally, three things will be tested in the exam. So based on the demand, we'll have not enough resources to fulfill the demand. Now, if you read this question, you can see here, we have a sales demand. That means in the market, we have a demand for product X, 400 for product Y, 600, and product Z, we have 400. So this is a demand we have. And uh, to fulfill the demand, we need uh, material 800 kilo for X, and for Y, we need 480 kilo, and for Z, we need 720 kilo. So if we added this three, 800 plus 480, and plus 720. So to fulfill the demand, uh, we need 800 plus 480 plus 720. So we need 2000 kilo. If I like to fulfill all the demand, I need 2000 kilo of the material. But unfortunately we can see the question told us we have only a limited amount of material, so that is 1,600 kilo. They say the business has 1,600 kilogram of material in inventory, which it can use to manufacture three products, X, Y, and Z. And that means I don't have enough material to fulfill all the demand. So I need to now look at which product I'm going to make first, which one I'm going to make later, or which one I'll not make at all. So how I take the decision? I take the decision based on which product will give me more profit. Simple as this. Now let's try to understand how it works. First, I'm going to look at which product give me how much contribution and what is the limiting factor per unit. So let's try to understand it. The question asking us to complete the table to show the optimal production plan. Optimal production plan means which way we can have a maximum profit? What is the best combination of the product which give us the maximum profit? And we have some fixed cost here, that is 755. All right, let's start with our calculation. We have a product X, material required per unit. So in one unit, how much material we need? So we can see here, for 400 unit, we need 800 kilo. So if we say 800 kilo for 400 unit, that means per unit we need two kg. So we said we need two kg for product X. The next one is asking contribution per unit. How much is the contribution per unit? So you can see we have a selling price and the variable cost. So selling price minus a variable cost, this is our contribution. So four minus 150, so that should be 250. So contribution 250. And then we have a product Y, same way we'll do. 
So 800 is the demand and 480 kilos. So 480 divide 600 and that will give me 0 0.80 per kilo. So 0 0.80. And the next one we have here, 720 divide 400, and it will give you 1.80 per kilo per unit. So we need 1.8 kilo per unit. The contribution for product Y, 3 minus 1.4, that is 1.60. And 5 minus 2.30, and that is 2.70. So if we look at now with the contribution per unit, it look like the product Z, the product Z give us more contribution that is two pounds 70 per unit. Then we can see product X give me two pound 50, then product Y. So is it look like I'm going to make all the product Z first, then I'm going to make all the product X. Then I'm going to make all the product Y. So my ranking will be Z number one, X number two, and Y number three. So if I just look at the contribution per unit. But the interesting fact here is we're not going to look at contribution per unit. We're going to look at contribution per a limiting factor. The reason we're going to use it because we don't have enough material to fulfill all the demand. And for that reason, we have to look at which material or which, which product give me more contribution based on using the less material. For example, it is possible the product X can take more material or product Y can take less. If we have a look now, the product is X is taking two kilo for one unit. Product Y is taking only 0.8 and product Z is taking 1.8. That means within this three product, Y taking the less material than X and Z. So now I'm going to look at the contribution part limiting factor. So how we do that? So contribution divide by two. So we have a contribution 2.5 for X and divide by two is the limiting factor. So we need two hour to make one unit. So per kilo, my contribution will be 2.5 divided by uh, two. That gives me 1.25. So if I use one kilo of the material for product X, my contribution is 1.25. So the same way I'll do for product X, that is 1.60 divide 0 0.80, that gives me two, and product Z, 2.70 divide 1.80, that will give me 1.5. So now you can see the picture is completely different now. So if I make Y, I'm getting per kilo, my contribution is two. And if I make uh, Z is 1.5 and X 1.25. Now I have to change the decision completely. So you can see before I said, I'm gonna make all the Z first. Now I will say, no, I'm not gonna make all the Z first. I'm going to make all the X first because X give me contribution per limiting factor because I don't have enough material to make all this product. So I need to see what is the best uses of my scare resources or the resources I have shortest. So be careful with that. We always give the ranking or the priority based on the contribution per limiting factor, not the normal contribution. So very careful with that. Now I can say, I'm going to make product Y first. So that's my first ranking. Then I'm going to make product Z, that's my second ranking. And if I have any material left, then I'm going to use for X. So that means number one, I'm going to complete all the demand that is 480 for our, uh, uh, sorry, 600 for our Z, uh, Y. So I'm going to make all this Y first. That's my first priority. 
and then I'll see how many uh, materials I have left to make Z and then X. So let's try to understand first. So for the X, uh, for the Y, I need par unit, I need 0.8 kilo. So for the 600 unit, I need 0.8. So that will give me 600 times 0.8, 420 kilo. And do not forget, we have total 1600 kilo. So you have 420 kilo we're going to use for Y. The next one we have here, that is Z. I'm going to make Z because Z give me 1.5, the next contribution, higher contribution for limiting factor. So I need 1.80 kilo per unit. So I have a demand for 400. So 400 unit times 1.80. So 400 times 1.8. And I need 720 kilo. So how many unit we have? 720. So I already use here 1140 kilo. And I have total 1600. So if I minus the 1600, minus 1140, so how many kilo we have left? So we have 460 kilo left. This 460 kilo I'm going to use for my final product X. So I said 460 and we need uh, two kilo per unit. So how many unit we can make divide by two. So we can make here, so we have 460 divide two and that gives me uh, 230 kilo. Now quickly check once again, remember that we don't want to make any mistake. So for the first one, we can see 600, the demand and uh, per unit we need 0.8 kilo. So 600 times 0.8, that gives me 400. So it's not 420, it's 480 actually. So it's 480. And the next one we have here, that is uh, 400 times 1.8, that is 720. So 720 plus 480, that gives me 1200. So I have 1200 here, not 1140. Very careful with the calculator. So I was doing the calculator from a little bit far, so I didn't see it, it is like 480. Anyway, so we have 400. So if we minus 1200 from here, I have actually 400 left. 1600 minus 1200, that gives me 400. So with the 400, I'm going to use for x and 400 divided by 2, that gives me 200. So I can make all the 400 for z. And the remaining I'm going to use for x. Now you can see, I can fulfill the demand for y, I can fulfill the demand for z. But I cannot fulfill all the demand for X that is 400 unit. I can make only 200 because I don't have enough material to make it. So that's it. This is the first table. So this is my optimal plan. So I'm going to make all the Y first, then Z and then X. The next one is asking number B, how much will be the profit? So it's quite simple how to calculate the profit. Let's quickly do the profit before we go to the explanation for that. So if you look at the profit, all you have to do, you have to see how many units you are making. For example, for the Z, we are making 400. And this time I'm going to use the contribution. Remember that when you're going to calculate the profit, I'm going to use the normal contribution per unit, not the limiting factor. The limiting factor will only help me to take the decision which one I'm going to make first. Very careful with that. But when you're going to calculate the profit, I'm going to use the contribution per unit, not the limiting factor. So 400 times 2.70. So 400 times 2.7. And that gives me 1080. That's my first contribution from the Z. Then we have a, a Y. Then we have 600. 600 is the unit I'm going to make. Per unit, I'm going to get the contribution 
So 600 times 1.60, that's 960. And from the X, I'll make 200 unit. And the power unit contribution is 2.5. It should be 500. So we have 1080 plus 960 plus 500. And total contribution, we have 2540. This is my total contribution. And from this contribution, 25 and uh, 40, I have to minus the fixed cost. So we have some fixed cost that is uh, 7 by 5. So minus the fixed cost, 7 by 5. And that will give me the profit is 1785. And this is our profit. All right, so I think that's it, our uh, profit. And this is the optimal production plan. This is the way we're going to fulfill the demand. All right, the next part we have, that will be the explanation of what we have just done here. So it will ask, analyze, why the company cannot fulfill its total demand and uh, uh, why it has chosen to make the quantity of each product. So it's quite simple. We already said that because we show the workings. We cannot fulfill all the demand because we have only a limited number of uh, material left. So we'll say like to fulfill all the demand, we need 2000 kilo of material that we have calculated. We can show the workings here, make sure you need to show the workings. But we have only 1600 kilo material available. The next thing we're going to say, uh, which one are we going to make first? So you can say like, uh, to have optimal production plan, we should make the unit that gives higher contribution per limiting factor, not the contribution per unit. And finally, we have to show some workings, like what happens if we make X first, then Y, then Z, how much will be the profit? Same way we have done. So we need to show if we choose X, Y, Z, not Y, then Z, X, and what happened the profit if we make Y, then Z, then X. And we have to show the figure, like what will be the profit. The way we show like for the optimal plan, exactly same way we do the calculation, we multiply with the contribution for X and Y and Z. And you will see this profit will be lower for X, Y, Z. And if we make uh, Y, Z and X, then it will be higher contribution. So this is the one we just want to show with the workings and uh, make sure when you do the writing task, not only just write, you need to put some number because it will give you the number. And the question always say like, show the working, you should use the calculation. That means you should always give the number. It's a very interesting question. If you uh, practice this question, it's very common in the exam as well. Hopefully it will be very helpful for you if you understand it. All right, let's move to our next question. Question number eight. And uh, this is our last question from this assessment. And this is from the target costing. Now target costing is quite interesting and it's uh, quite easy as well. So all you have to do, you have to find the selling price. So let's say for example, the selling price is 10 and you have to know how much is the target profit margin. Let's say if I'm looking for a target profit, 20%, uh, that means I'm looking for profit two. So my target cost will be, so first I have the selling price, then I minus the profit, and uh, the difference I have, this is my target cost. Now, if my estimated cost, for example, estimated cost 
for example, nine, but my target cost is eight. So the difference between the target cost and the estimated cost, we called it cost gap. So you always try to look for the way we can reduce the cost gap in order to achieve this profit, two pound profit, I have to make sure my cost is not more than eight. But if my estimated cost is more than eight, I'll not be able to achieve the profit. So this difference is called cost gap. And this cost gap, we have to reduce as much as possible to achieve our profit. All right, let's read this question first, what we have here. 15 marks, question number eight. Use the following information to answer all questions. A business is a planning to introduce a new product which is expected to have a short life. The product need to make an operating profit margin 25%. So looking for a profit 25%. Market research suggested that in total, the business will be able to sell 20,000 units of the product. So that's my demand on the market. The budgeted selling price for the product is 18. So you have a selling price as well. Resource and development, we have a 65. Variable manufacturing cost, 140. Fixed, 45. And end of life cost is 35. Now, this is all about the life cycle costing. Remember that when the product have a short life, and then you can have all the cost. So normally, when you make a product, normally we consider the variable and the fixed. But if the question asks you how much will be the impact of the cost over its life cycle, then you have to consider all of this. Remember that you have to consider the resource and development, then variable, then fixed, then end of life. Then time you have to add all of this. But normally when you look at the production cost, we only look for the variable and the uh, fixed. So this is our story for this uh, question. Calculate the figure in the table. So we have here total anticipated sales revenues. So asking how much will be the sales revenue is quite simple. So you have a 20,000 unit. So sales revenue have 20,000 unit times per unit is 18. So 20,000 times 18. That is 360,000. That's my sales revenue. Then we're looking for a target uh, profit. There's a 25% profit we're looking for. It's a target profit, 25%. So how much is the 25% of that? 25% of 360,000. And that will give us 90,000. That's my target uh, profit. And if you minus the target profit, the difference we'll have, that's the target cost. Target cost. And that will be 270,000. So you have the sales revenue that is 360,000. The total target operating profit, we have 90,000. And uh, then we have a target cost that is 270,000. Remember, if the question does not mention to put a minus sign for this 90,000, do not do that. Just put the positive figure, but target cost, you know, you know how to do it. So sales minus the profit, but do not use the bracket or minus if the question do not mention that. Target cost per unit. So this is my target cost, 270. And for 20,000 unit, and that gives me 270 divided by 20,000, uh, 13.5 per unit. So 13.5. That's quite simple. It's not difficult. So let's move to the next section. The next section is asking, if there is some changes, so let's have a look. The market research mentioned at the start of the task also indicated that customer would purchase more of the product if the selling price is reduced by one per unit. 
Now they are saying if the selling price from 18, if you make 17, then more people will buy it. The business will consider making this price reduction if it can sell enough unit to maintain the operating profit 25%. So business says we don't mind if we have the same profit, then it's okay, we can reduce the selling price. So you can see here, the selling price is now 17. Complete the table below, assuming life cycle costs are to be same as in A above, answer must be given the nearest penny. So need to do the nearest penny, okay? So now the selling price is 17 and the target operating profit per unit. How much will be the target operating profit per unit? Now, uh, obviously like before, if you remember our profit was 90,000 and for 20,000 unit. So it was 4.5. Now it will be a little bit reduced. Now we say like for 20,000 unit, if we sell 17 per unit, so 20,000, times 17, that will give us 340,000, 340,000. That's my sales, 340. And if we have a 25% of the profit, so times 25%, and that will give me 85,000, the profit. So 85,000 divided by 20,000, So that gives me 4.25. That means before it was 4.5, now it is 4.25. Because of the reduced selling price, my profit per unit is reduced by 25 pence per unit. All right, and then the target cost per unit. So how much will be the target cost per unit? So 17 minus 4.25, so it will give us 12.75. That's the difference between these two. That's my target cost. Then expected variable cost per unit. Now the question said the variable cost will be seven. So how much my fixed cost has to be? This is my total cost, 12.75. So from 12.75, if my variable cost is seven, so I can have maximum the fixed cost 5.75. That's my target fixed cost. If it is more than that, then I'll not be able to achieve this target. Remember that. So the total cost here is 12.75. And out of 12.75, the quotient already said a uh, seven will be for the variable. So the rest will be fixed. So the difference between 12.75 minus seven, it will give us 5.75. So fixed cost cannot be more than that. All right, the next one we have calculated the number of units that the business would need to sell to maintain a profit margin of 25% to the nearest whole unit, the required sales volume. Now, this one is like a target profit the way we do, so you need to do a little bit of working. So let's have a look at how we can do that. So let's do the workings here. Even though this question have only one box, so this could be really tricky. And uh, obviously like uh, the answer I have uh, based on my workings is not exactly matching with the answer we have in the AT. So if anyone have uh, uh, a different answer, you can always uh, let me know. You can write it down on the comment. But uh, based on my uh, workings, our uh, previous profit if you uh, the sales was 360,000 if you remember the last question we have done so this is our anticipated sell and uh, our target cost uh, we can see here that we have 12.75 now after reducing one pound and before it was uh, here 13.5 uh, so the difference between these two we have here that is uh, 0.75 pence and if I added the 75 pence with my target cost uh, that is 12.75 uh, plus 0.75 and that gives me um, sorry 13.5 plus 0.75 that gives me 14.25 so the cost gap we have, that is 0.75, that gives me 14.25. So if I like to get the sale of 360,000, I like to keep a profit of 25%. So divide 14.25, 
So that will give us 360,000 divide 14.25. And that gives me 225,263. All right, so I'm still not happy. I think like some information is missing here, but I'll have a double check if I find some more information. I'll try to write on the comment section later on. So for the time being, we can say this is the question for one box. It should not be that difficult uh, because it's only for one box. Anyway, so the next one we have here is just a comment. It says like discuss the concept of life cycle costing and the life cycle costing is all about starting from the growth to end life. So here we consider all the costs. So we consider all the cost of a product life cycle. And number two is look at what is the anticipated target cost. So based on our forecast, based on the plan, if my return is more or if the cost is more than the return, so we should not launch that product. But if the return is more than the cost, then we should launch. So here, if you remember, our target cost was 270,000 here. So target cost was 270,000 here. And if you add it, our uh, life cycle cost, if you added 65, 140, 45, and 35, it will give you 285. So we can say like our target cost is 270, but actually the life cycle cost is uh, 285. So we should not uh, launch this uh, product. So we need to explain a little bit about how is it work. We can say life cycle costing involved, taking account all the costs of the product life cycle. And obviously, typically, this is used for the product having a short life and would involve the resource and development costs, cost fix and variable cost and the end life cost. So we'll add all the cost and this cost has to be uh, uh, less uh, than our target cost. Now you can see our target cost is 270, but our life cycle cost is 285. So obviously, like the cost is easily more here, uh, 15,000 uh, more than our target cost, so obviously will be end up with a loss or less profit. So for that reason, we should not launch this product because uh, our target is, uh, our actual cost is more than the target cost. So this is not very difficult. If you read this question, hopefully you'll be fine. And, uh, and that's it. Hopefully like if you practice, you will understand more and uh, uh, try to read some area from the book as well. Do not just practice from here. If you stuck any question here, always go back to the book. Try to find it out more explanation. Thank you very much. Hopefully this recording will be helpful for your study. If you have any question, feel free to email me. I'll try to help you if I can. Thank you very much everyone for watching.